Hello my friends and welcome to the Curate Study. My name is the Reverend Mark Kerslake and no matter who you are, where you are or what you believe even, it's great to have you here. So today we are at the last Sunday in Advent. So this is the last Sunday in the church's year. A lot of people think the church's year runs from the beginning of January to the end of December, but it doesn't. It runs from the first week in Advent, which is next Sunday, and to the last week before Advent, which is this week. Uh, so we're about to tick over into a new year. The readings will change. We'll be in year C in the lectionary, which is the book that guides our, um, our three year cycle of readings in the church. If you want to know more about how this all works, we did a whole Wandering Wednesday on this last year. So look back over the YouTube channel videos and you'll find it. So what is what is today? Well, as well as being the last Sunday in Advent, it's uh, the last Sunday before Advent. It's also Christ the King. So today we celebrate um, our, the climax, really, the uh, the conclusion of our liturgical journey through the life of Christ, and we begin to look forward to restelling, restarting the sequence of events of Christ's life, the lead up to his birth, obviously his death uh, at crucifixion and his being reborn again, rising from the dead. And today we celebrate the coming reign of the Christ as king of the earth and the beginning of his kingdom here on earth as well. That's what Christ the King is all about. It is an essential truth, the truth of our faith that Christ is King and Lord of all and we are involved in building his kingdom here and now and we're going to talk a little bit about that in our sermon but before we begin we're going to have the collect for um, this Sunday which is Christ the King the Sunday next before Advent Eternal Father, whose Son Jesus Christ ascended to the throne of heaven, that he might rule over all things as Lord and King. Keep the Church in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace, and bring the whole created order to worship at his feet, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now it's time for our first hymn, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us. have our Bible reading and, and our sermon we're going to spend a time of reflection and confession so today we're going to do something slightly different so we are going to acknowledge our part in the problems of the world that all of the sins of the world begin in the human heart and we're going to do that with a time of silent reflection where we call to mind our own problems 
and our own sins, those things that contribute to the great car crash that is often the world around us, small beginnings inside each and every one of us. And now may the God of all truth bring you back to that place of truth. May he reassure you of his love, cleanse you of your sins and heal you and bring you peace. In Jesus' name, Amen. So our reading for today is a reading all about truth. Um, and it starts in the book of John, uh, chapter 18, verse 33. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is the truth? What is the truth? Well, when I was a police officer, truth was a big part of what we did, or the seeking of the truth. And one of the ways we did that was by interviewing people who were suspected of having committed a criminal offence. And trust me, it's nothing like on Midsummer Murders or Poirot, when officers wander around and chat to people in their living rooms. So it goes a bit like this. The suspect, having had access to legal advice, is led to an interview room containing a table and chairs. And the interviewing officer unseals two tapes in the presence of the suspect and their solicitors, although now it's probably CDs or some sort of digital recording technique. Everything is recorded and the suspect or his representative is given a copy at the end of the interview. And the police copy is booked into evidence. All of the parties in the room identify themselves and then the police officer states the time, the date and the location of the police station where the interview is taking place. The suspect is reminded they're under caution, you know, you do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so, etc, etc. And the interview begins. Now initially the interviewing officer will ask general questions. They're the classic, where were you on such and such a day at such and such a time? Then the officer will gradually narrow down the field of questioning, asking for more and more details. And it's only when the officer feels he's got as many details as he wants that he might start to challenge as is appropriate. You see, the idea is, is to get the suspect to completely commit to a story with all the details so that when the officer starts to challenge it, if he backtracks, it makes it clear that he was lying. So 2,000 years ago in our story, a powerful representative of the world's sole superpower questions a nobody dressed in a dirty and bloodied robe, who'd been dragged there by armed men in the middle of the night, sent by the Jewish council. There'd been a hastily called hearing before the man was then sent on to Pilate, who was the Roman governor. But he felt he had no jurisdiction over the case. So he sent the prisoner back to Herod, the king. Herod agreed to question the man, more out of curiosity than serious investigation, but then he decided there was no case to answer for him. So he sent the man back to Pilate again. Now, the chief local religious leaders had followed along as the desperate prisoner was pulled from pillar to post and questioned. No doubt hoping they could push the matter, they could force the ruling authorities to execute him. So there's no legal process here as we know it, not like today, no right to legal advice, no nice cup of tea or coffee or a warm interview room. It was a simple beating, questioning, no right of appeal and possibly, probably 
a death sentence. Parliament had done this before, of course, many times. Many other rebels and rowdy street preachers stirring up revolution would have stood before him. Because part of Pilate's job was to protect the interests of the Roman Empire, and challenges would likely result in only one thing. Are you the king of the Jews? he asks. Yes or no, you either are or you aren't. Which is it? So Pilate has moved directly to the challenge phase. It's all business. He wants to get this sorted. The stakes are high, and if anything, Pilate seems uncomfortable. You see, the Bible has told us that his wife had had a prophetic dream about Jesus and warned Pilate to have nothing to do with this man. But Pilate, of course, was not a man who was used to doing what he was told. He wants the truth now. He wants to understand. This is a man who's used to being in control and here it seems that his control might be slipping because in his palace are a group of powerful local leaders who want this man dead and outside probably is a baying crowd who want the same thing. He's tried to dodge the issue by sending the man to Herod and yet here he is again stood right in front of him. We all want to possess the truth, don't we? Because it makes us feel clever and it makes us feel safe. I've often felt that's probably why young people are so drawn to the evangelical congregations and churches. Because often many of them promise absolute, unshakable certainty. In fact, even in some of them, sadly, doubt can be seen as a sin. But as Christians, of course, we are all truth seekers. That is what we do. But there's a difference, isn't there, between seeking the truth and claiming to hold it absolutely. Claiming to have absolute truth is a claim to power. When humans do this, it's usually followed by trying to impose that truth on everybody else. This is one of the great tragedies of human nature, of course, and it's happened time and time and time again in human history. And it's being lived anew again in our culture, isn't it? Take, for example, the current arguments about COVID vaccines by COVID sceptics, or the allegations of a stolen election in America. The battle of truth, of course, so often goes a bit like this. Conversation becomes debate, debate becomes argument, an argument becomes anger, and anger becomes violence. It is a mob storming the American Congress building and people dying. It's a suicide bomber in a taxi in Liverpool and people dying. It's an MP being murdered in his constituency office. And it's one man standing in front of a Roman governor facing crucifixion. If life has taught me one thing is that we never ever know the whole truth, no matter how we seek for it. I'm not sure we can or ever should really. Jesus did not answer Pilate directly because he knew either the man could not handle the truth or simply he would not accept it. Because it's never quite as simple as we would like it to be, is it? This is the stuff of the divine in this case. We are just human beings. The truth is so complex that Jesus took on human form to make it simple for us. Because in all of our history, despite all of God's power before this point, despite all of his presence and his voice in the world, we failed to understand it. Jesus came into the world not just to tell us about the truth, but to show us what it might look like. As Christians, we should not claim exclusive possession of the truth. No human ever can. This is to fall into the same trap as Pilate or the world we see today. Jesus never commands us at any point in scripture to know all of the truth, but just to recognize that he is it and then commit to following him. 
Sometimes when people ask me a really difficult theological question, I will tell them the answer is above my pay grade. And they often think I'm joking, but I'm not. Our job is just best, is our job is just as best we can to listen and learn from Jesus. He said to us, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. We need to do this, but also to be aware just how often we get it wrong. To do otherwise is to convince ourselves that our inner voice is always right, which of course makes us listen only to the people that agree with us. But we listen to a different voice. We listen to a voice that tells us, when there is bigotry, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. When there is hunger, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty I, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And when there is fear and insecurity, that same voice says to us, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And when there is death, it says to us, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And I'm ultimately, the only truth that we ever need to seek rests in just listening to that voice. Let's pray. In our ignorance, we come boldly to the throne of grace praying to the Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, for mercy and for grace. Father, we pray for a world desperate for the truth, created by your love, but this year so often racked by bigotry and hatred, suspicion and division. Help us to examine ourselves honestly, admit our bias and ignorance, and to struggle to work with you through them. We pray for its nations and its governments. We remember the arguments and the conflicts of the past 12 months, the sabre rattling and the posturing, all based so often on false truth. Help world leaders to work to be peacemakers, bridge builders and architects of growth, freedom and renewal. Lord, we pray for those who've become bitter and hate-filled in our political discourse and in discussions of so many issues from race to gender and sexuality. We ask for a new spirit of peace, pardoning, love, mercy and grace. We pray for the church created for your glory, but in this last year shaken and bruised. Empower us in your Holy Spirit, in our ministry, to reflect those works of yours which bring glory to you. Help us to be bold in speaking the truth that your voice gives us. Extend to us your salvation, your growth, your mercy and your grace. Amen. And now it's time for our next hymn, How Great is Our God.
It trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all we see how great, how great is our God. Before you go, my friends, a final blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and those whom you love today and always. And until we meet again, my friends, May God hold you in the palm of his hand. God bless.